Okay, so uh, welcome to the third uh, of our video lectures, our video lecture for module three. Um, for this module, uh, we're covering sort of the period of the American Revolution in the mid to late 1700s uh, and the lead up to it, along with the formation of the early United States in the late 1700s, maybe edging into the very start of the 1800s. Uh, the title is Revolution and New Nation with an S in parentheses because we'll also be briefly touching on another nation that has its own revolution against a European imperial power France instead of uh, Britain, uh, which will be Haiti. Uh, and we'll just touch on it briefly, and it'll be more of a focus of your assignment for this module, where you're going to compare and contrast the Declaration of Independence of the United States and of Haiti. So as you're going through the video lecture, you may want to pay particular attention to the moments when I talk about the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and then briefly at the end when I talk about the Haitian Rev Revolution, because I think those will be helpful in completing your assignment. So um, I'm going to just cover kind of a very brief overview and touch on some big points about the lead up to the American Revolution and the Constitution and the Haitian Revolution. And you'll be able to kind of um, get more detail from your reading. Um, and then there'll be a point where I skip over something you might be expecting me to talk about, the Boston Massacre which shows up in 1770. And I'm skipping over that here and I'll try and remember to note that because it's the focus of our case study, uh, which will be using visual sources, um, but doing it using the example of the Boston Massacre. So to start with, we need to think um, about the situation among American colonists and European powers before the American Revolution. So as you've seen in your readings, throughout the 1700s, um, white colonists in North America, especially British colonists, have been looking to push westward from where they've largely colonized along the Atlantic coast towards the interior of the continent because they're in search of more land. This land is held by indigenous powers, uh, Native American nations, uh, so Great Britain is trying to prevent them from expanding uh, for fear of fighting costly wars with powerful Native American groups. But at the same time as Britain is trying to contain their own colonists, they're also in conflict with the French and the Spanish and other European powers over the future of North America. So this is a map of, as you can see here, 1763. At that point, Great Britain, at least relative to other European powers, has gained a claim to all of what will become the United States east of the Mississippi River, as well as, some, as most of what is Canada, or will become Canada. But if we looked at that map in 1750, you would see the British along the Atlantic coast and some of the Gulf Coast, and you would see the French containing most of this interior area. And the reason for this shift is a lengthy, costly war known as the Seven Years War. Uh, you may also have heard of it in high school as the French and Indian War, which is a term that applies specifically to what's going in, on in North America. The Seven Years War is a larger war between European powers fought in Europe the Americas and around the world. So for our purposes, all we really need to know about the Seven Years' War is it was fought over many things, but one of those things was the future of North America for European powers. That Britain is victorious in this war and as a result gains claim to much of what will become the United States, basically the whole area, as I mentioned, east of the Mississippi River. But this comes at great cost. As wars do, obviously the biggest cost is human life. But the cost that the crown, the British king, a guy named George III, cares most about is not really human life. What George III cares most about is money. And George at the time is a relatively new king. He's kind of come to power during the Seven Years' War. And he's working with the other element of 
British government, the elected parliament, to try and figure out what to do about the cost of the war. Yes, Great Britain has managed to um, acquire these huge new territories, at least relative to other European claims, Native American groups would beg to differ. In doing so, they've accumulated huge war debts. And it's hard for me to emphasize kind of the scale of these debts, the borrowing Britain did to fight a costly war around the world. But maybe the best way of thinking about it is not the raw dollar amount, because then we have to convert historically and in terms of how much money governments had. Historically, um, Great Britain borrowed about 150 million pounds. But I think a better way to think of it is Great Britain borrowed just to fight this war three times their national budget. So their annual budget was about 50 million pounds at the time. And they borrowed 150 million over the course of the war. And to give you a sense of kind of what this, how unimaginably almost large this number is, the US budget right now, well, it'd be much higher in 2020, but in 2019, the US budget was about $4.5 trillion. So this is like the United States borrowing 13 or $14 trillion to fight a war. At a certain point, that becomes overwhelming, right? Th this would be like two thirds of the US total national debt borrowed just for one war. And so Britain decides they need to find ways to pay it down. It's becoming crippling. Just not paying the actual debt, but paying the interest is taking half their annual budget now. So if you think about it this way, say somebody made a decent salary. Say somebody made $50,000 a year, right? That might be a pretty good salary depending on where you live and kind of what you're, you're hoping for. But if your interest on paying your credit card is $25,000 a year, you only have $25,000 left, right? After paying half of it to your credit card company. So Great Britain's in real trouble and they decide, well, we need to start to raise more money. And George's advisors tell him, well, there's a good way to do this. We need to start taxing the colonists because in this period, the British colonists in North America, basically not exactly, but largely aren't paying taxes. And they say, well, we fought this war in large part for them. So let's start taxing them, right? And they start looking to tax the colonies and they start not even by implementing a new tax, but by closing loopholes in existing tax taxes. So they take some existing tax uh, on sugar, like imports of sugar from the Caribbean or elsewhere. And they say like, we'll actually lower your tax, but we're actually gonna make you pay it, right? So it's effectively a new tax. And this tax, and this is gonna be an important distinction, is called an indirect tax. So the Sugar Act is an indirect tax. And what an indirect tax means is if you're a normal consumer in the country, you don't directly pay that tax. So for example, if you go to the store to buy sugar, there's no tax that you see on the sugar. But the people, the company or merchants importing the sugar they have to pay like an import tax basically on sugar. And so what this means is when you go to the store and you pay like $5 for a bag of sugar, there's no additional tax. But maybe that bag of sugar cost $4 a year ago because the merchant is paying a dollar of tax on it and passing it on to you. So basically an indirect tax is something that you as a consumer might feel the effect of, but don't directly pay. But what really riles up a lot of European colonists in the Americas, British colonists, is what happens the next year. So this Sugar Act is in 1764, uh, the year after the Seven Years' War is ending. The following year, in 1765, Britain passes another act to create a new tax. But this new tax is different. It's a direct tax, meaning you pay it directly. So like an example of a direct tax in your life is sales tax, right? So if you go to the store um, 
to buy like a t-shirt, you pay a certain percent sales tax on that, right? And that tax goes directly to the government. So that's a direct tax. So this stamp act is a direct tax. Basically what it means is you have to pay a certain amount of money. You might be able to sort of see here, in this case, it's one shilling, which was like, you know, a small portion of a pound. To purchase a stamp that would have to be affixed to certain things. And the things that you would have to include a stamp on, and this stamp is just like a, this, something like this, it's not like a postage stamp. It's just, it's the same word, but something different. Um, these stamps would have to be fixed on pretty much any kind of paperwork. So if you're writing a will, if you're signing a contract with somebody, or if you want to publish a book or a newspaper, you have to get stamps, right? And they're basically show that this is approved and official from the government. But British colonists in North America aren't used to paying taxes and they don't like it. And they're, they're, they go up in arms when they're having to pay these taxes. And their rationale is, under British ideas of government, we should only have to pay taxes if we have representation, right? And this is an idea we still see reflected in the United States. Basically in, in Britain proper, like the British islands, they pay taxes, but also have an opportunity to vote for representatives to parliament. In the colonies, they don't really pay taxes, but they also don't have a vote. And they're saying, well, now you're adding ta taxation without representation, right? And if some of you have been to Washington, D.C., you might notice that the license plates in Washington, D.C. actually say taxation without representation. Because Washington, D.C., people pay, as U.S. citizens, taxes there, but do not have a voting member of Congress, right? The same is true in many British, or many uh, U.S., uh, territories, Puerto Rico, Samoa, places like that, where people are U.S. citizens but aren't allowed to elect members of Congress, senators, and so on. Um, so this taxation without representation becomes a real rallying cry, pushing back against British colonial government. Here we have a picture of woodcut, which was the kind of thing that would be published in a newspaper, of um, an effigy, like a, a doll, basically, of a tax collector in New Hampshire, and they're throwing stones at the tax collector to show their displeasure. And a year later, just one year after passing the Stamp Act, the British government walks it back, uh, and they say, okay, we clearly moved too quickly. This is leading to too much protest. We're going to back off. <laughs> uh, but by this point, people are angry, and simply repealing this one tax isn't going to satisfy them. And tensions keep increasing. A few years later in 1770, there's something called the Boston Massacre that we'll explore in our case study video, which further inflames tensions. A few years after that, there's something called the Boston Tea Party, which you can see in your reading and you may be familiar with. Um, and the Boston Tea Party is when a bunch of Bostonians who are angry with the British, for some reason, dress up as indigenous people. Uh, and for much clearer reasons, board British trading vessels, trading ships, and throw a bunch of British tea into the Boston Harbor as an act of protest against another form of taxation, the details of which we won't get into, you can look to your reading for that. After these things, uh, in 1774, the British government passes a series of laws called the Intolerable Acts. And you can look up the specifics of them in your readings, but they're basically a series of restrictions on the colony of Massachusetts, where Boston is and where a lot of the unrest has been, uh, doing a number of things. For example, um, making it so the royal governor, the British representative in Massachusetts, um, chooses government officials instead of people in Massachusetts electing them. Um, they close the Boston Harbor, basically shutting down the Massachusetts economy until the tea is paid for. They do a number of things. And people in Massachusetts, but also in many colonies, British colonies around North America, start to refer to these as the intolerable acts because they say they've gone too far. Britain has overstepped completely. And, over the, and then uh, members of different 
colonies in North America start to come together in things called, uh, again, reference to your reading, called the Continental Congress to express their displeasure. And within a year or so, the Intolerable Acts in 1775, shots between um, American forces calling themselves patriots and the British Royal Army have been fired in New England, uh, Massachusetts area, places called Lexington and Concord at what some consider the first shots of the American Revolution. And so the revolution itself, uh, people give different dates, right? Some might say Lexington and Concord in 1775. Others might say the Declaration of Independence in 1776. There's a whole bunch of different dates you could give. And then it would end in 1781 when sort of fighting ends, or 1783 when the treaty is signed. In this class, I'm not gonna test you on dates. Uh, there might be a couple that come up in your reading quiz, but there won't be dates that come up in the video lecture. And I should also note here, both your reading quizzes and your video lecture quizzes are open books. So you can refer back to the video and the reading as you're doing them. So like, don't get stressed about dates. You can always refer back. So one of the first things that happens um, as fighting starts to break out and as American colonies start to work together to push back against the British, keeping in mind at this point they haven't declared independence and it's not open warfare, is they start to put together a military force. And they need a commander for the military force. And they chose this, choose this guy pictured here in a, pa a famous painting, George Washington. And they choose, choose George Washington partly because he's a relatively experienced military officer but also they choose him because they're seeking to unite a bunch of pretty different colonies. Up to this point, much of the kind of radicalism against the British has come out of New England, places like Massachusetts, and then Boston within that. And among leaders, there's a real concern that they want it to be a broader movement. So they need to choose a military leader, they think, from outside of the area. Additionally, places like Massachusetts are starting to become more willing to push back against slavery. And to try to unite white Americans, they decide they need an enslaver, someone who holds people in slavery, to lead their government or to lead their military. So they choose George Washington, who's from Virginia, and a man who holds hundreds of people in slavery uh, at his plantations in Virginia or plantation in Virginia. In addition to choosing a leader, um, the colonies also start to need to build a government. They say, well, if we're gonna to unite to push back against the British, and maybe it's still debated at this point, declare our independence, we need to be able to do things like not just raise an army, but pay the army, buy weaponry, things like that. So uh, they decide to issue their own money. They do it in weird ways. This is, for example, an $8 bill from uh, the revolutionary period, uh, so an odd denomination, but their money is not super effective, right? So if you think about how money works, right? If you use actual cash still instead of like cards, you have like a physical dollar bill, $5 bill, $20 bill, and you can take that anywhere in the US and buy one, five, $20 worth of goods with it. But why? Right? It's just a piece of paper. The reason is not because the US, as it originally tried to do, has like enough gold to back all of that money, right? It used to be for the first century or so of US history that the US kept enough gold or gold and silver to pay out every dollar of US currency in circulation. That's not been the case for over a century. Basically, that dollar bill is worth money because you trust the US government to guarantee it and to still exist, right? But in 1775, 1776, nobody really trusts this fledgling Continental Congress or rebellious colonies. They're about to fight Great Britain, which is at the time probably the most powerful military in the world. And they don't have a government, they don't have an army, they don't have a navy, they don't even have money, really. 
So every time people get, say, this $8 bill, and they go to try and purchase $8 worth of cloth, the people who they try and buy it from are like, why would I take this? If you lose this war, this money's worthless. And they say, well, okay, I'll take it. But I'm only going to give you $1 worth of goods because I'm taking all this risk that your money is going to be worthless. And this leads to inflation, right? If every time you go try and spend your $8 bill, it's only actually worth $1 in the equivalent of like, say, British money, then $8 US is worth $1. I mean, Great Britain doesn't use dollars, but the equivalent of $1 British, right? So it's inflated, right? In the same way, if you travel, US dollars convert to different amounts in different places, right? Uh, so US money inflates greatly. Uh, and the government quickly goes into debt because it has to issue huge amounts of money to purchase much smaller quantities of things. As the conflict is starting, uh, a guy named John, Earl of Dunmore, he's um, the British king's representative who runs the colony of Virginia. Uh, Virginia. He issues a proclamation in 1775 as these things are going on in Lexington and Concord that really deals a big blow to the American colonies' efforts. And this is, he says, the British government will give freedom to every enslaved person who fights with the British. The US never makes this promise to enslave people who fight for them. And as a result, about 100,000 enslaved people through the course of the revolution fight for the British, and fewer than 9,000 fight for the United States. So enslaved people overwhelmingly side with the British, many escaping plantations, including plantations of prominent founding fathers, like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, etc., to fight against them on the side of the British. In fact, one British regiment uh, of formerly enslaved people, their uniform um, says across it, liberty to slaves, right? Says it on the, on the uniform. And so the American Revolution becomes this complicated uh, thing where, you know, often we have these narratives that the United States was fighting against British tyranny, but at the same point, enslaved people are fighting against the tyranny of, you know, U.S. enslavers. So there's all of these kind of things going on at the same time. And even for many white Americans, they aren't sure that the United States should try to become independent of Britain. They see like the power of the British military. They all kind of feel British, right? They've been taught their whole lives that they're British subjects. So the people who call themselves patriots, who are trying to push for, for, for independence from Britain, issue propaganda, right? Both sides issue propaganda. And the most famous piece of propaganda from the revolution is probably a pamphlet called Common Sense, issued by a Scottish guy who just moved to the US called, uh, and, and the pamphlet's called Common Sense. Um, the guy's named Thomas Paine. And he basically has this like screed where he says it's ridiculous for a continent to be ruled by an island, right? You should be able to separate yourself from Great Britain and live peacefully away from the squabbles of Europe. And Paine gets a lot of prominent supporters, people like John Adams, who will eventually go on to become the second president of the United States. And he starts to persuade, along with much of this other propaganda, people to join the patriot cause. And at the same time, British propaganda is trying to persuade people to remain loyal to Britain. And so the terms that we'll use are patriots for British colonists in North America who want independence and loyalists for British colonists in America who want to remain part of Britain. Eventually, representatives from the different colonies gather and issue on July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence. It's a famous document. It's copied in your assignment for this week and where you compare it with the Haitian Revolution or the Haitian Declaration of Independence. Um, 
And often people think about the Constitution, which we'll certainly talk about. But in fact, the Declaration of Independence is probably the most influential US document around the world. The Constitution isn't copied by that many countries, right? The US Constitution is fairly distinctive. But its Declaration of Independence inspired many independence movements around the world from movements around the same time. For example, a leader with a name that might sound familiar to you, depending on your musical taste. Uh, a leader, Tupac Amaru, was a leader of an indigenous rebellion in Peru against Spanish colonization that ended up leading to 110,000 deaths. Um, their Declaration of Independence that Tupac Amaru issues in 1780, I believe, is inspired by the US Declaration, right? There's one in Belgium, like people wanting independence from Belgium, uh, they issue one in 1790 based on the declaration, but it's not just in the Americas and Europe. Um, in 1911, China has a declaration of independence uh, that is inspired by the US declaration. And even ironically, given the US's attempt to prevent this, um, in 1945, Vietnam issues a declaration of independence from France based on the US declaration. So it's a, it's a document that's really influential around the world. And that's kind of one reason why I've chosen to make it your assignment for this week or make your assignment based on it. Uh, and also to make your assignment thinking about it in a broader context, in this case uh, of Haiti. So this is a map that just hopefully can quickly illustrate to you that the colonies that end up becoming the so-called 13 colonies that form the United States eventually, are very divided in terms of whether they want to support independence or not. So the blue are strongly loyalist areas. The green areas are areas where it's sort of neck and neck between loyalist and patriot. And the red areas are patriot strongholds. Now from this, it might look overwhelmingly like the patriots have support. But it's actually more evenly divided than you would think. Historians' best guesses are about 40% of British colonists in the region favored the Patriots, 20% the Loyalists, and 40% were undecided. Um, it looks different because Patriot support was highest in rural areas, and Loyalist support was highest in cities, which have, you know, higher, denser populations. So the total area doesn't reflect population. You'll also notice that Nova Scotia, which is now part of Canada, is on this map because the 13 colonies wanted to be more than 13 colonies, right? They invite places that are part of Canada or the Carib or Caribbean nations now um, to join them. The 13 colonies just ended up being the people who agree. We're not going to get into the war itself. I just throw up this map to show you all sorts of stuff's going on. Uh, you can read about this in your reading, uh, which I think can cover the... American Revolution well. <laughs> uh, the short story is the Patriots do very poorly for a long time before eventually recovering and trapping uh, after six years of fighting the British at this place in Virginia with the help of the French Navy who join on the, the Patriot side at this place called Yorktown where the British surrender. During the war, the human cost is enormous. Um, there are something like 7,000 people who die in battle on the Patriot side, but an even higher number of people actually die as prisoners of war. The British don't consider the Patriots to be, if we think about it in modern parlance, legitimate combatants, enemy combatants, but instead to be treasonous rebels. And as such, they don't treat them according to standards of the time when they capture them. And instead of treating prisoners of war reasonably well, uh, as was custom in European warfare at the time, they put Patriot prisoners of war aboard prison ships that they dock in the harbor of New York and, and, and northern cities. This is one, the old Jersey. About 15,000 Patriots uh, are loaded aboard these ships, forced aboard these ships. Only 5,000 make it off alive. So 10,000 people die aboard these ships, two thirds death rate, uh, because they're on there for long, long periods of time, uh, right? We shouldn't compare this to the Atlantic slave trade as they're totally different. Um, 
but even so, it is a higher death rate than on the battlefield. Um, in addition, um, we've seen throughout our course the military and political power of Native American nations, and this is still the case during the American Revolution. And even though eventually the Patriot side fights the British to the point where the British um, leave, most Native American groups, although not all, some do side with the Patriots, side with the British uh, because in most cases, because they think the British are less likely to encroach on their territory rapidly than the Americans who've been the Patriots and who've been already pushing to take more and more indigenous territory. So finally, the fighting ends at this place, Yorktown, you don't need to remember, in 1781. And then it takes a couple years almost for all of the terms to be decided to end the war and formally have Britain agree to give the United States independence. Uh, and this happens in 1783 with something called the Treaty of Paris. And for us, the most important thing, obviously, is the United States gains its independence. In addition, the US makes some odd demands. The US demands the British return all seized property. But what they actually mean by this is as there is this period between the end of fighting and the treaty being signed, the British have retained control of New York City and they're not gonna give it up until the treaty is signed. And in New York City with British military forces are large numbers of formerly enslaved people who have gained their freedom by joining the British. When the British sign the Treaty of Paris, they agree to return, force these ensla formerly enslaved people back to the people who enslaved them, right? Basically returning them to slavery. However, after the treaty is signed, the British ignore this and uh, bring over 10,000 formerly enslaved people away with them when they leave New York City um, to Nova Scotia in what is Eastern Canada. Uh, many of these people um, stay and settle in Eastern Canada, and many decide to relocate to Sierra Leone in West Africa. Um, and if you're interested in this, um, there's a book that kind of goes through this story by a guy named Simon Shama called Rough Crossings that I encourage you to read if you're interested in kind of following that story. So apologies for this terrible map, but after the war, the United States basically controls the area from the Great Lakes down to Florida, from the Mississippi to the Atlantic, right? On paper. In practice, they really only control this Atlantic edge and little bits vary around the Great Lakes and Native American powers control most of the interior. And we'll see how that changes over time in our next couple modules. So the US is left after the war as a new nation, but they don't have the constitution yet. They have something called the Articles of Confederation, which is a weird kind of terrible document, right? Like you all know the complex ways that Congress votes now and that the government is structured. At this point in the Articles of Confederation, there's things that we expect don't exist, like a Supreme Court. Uh, voting is simple, <laughs> every state, gets one vote, <laughs> that's it. Um, our constitution has been amended dozens of times, right? Amendments include ending slavery, uh, extending voting rights to women, et cetera, et cetera. Under the Articles of Confederation, it's basically impossible to amend, but it, because it requires unanimous consent for any amendment. So it's this weird document. And quite quickly, leaders of the new nation realize they need a better, more flexible document. So 55 white men gather in Philadelphia uh, in the summer of 1787. And they shut themselves in Independence Hall to think about what the new governing document should look like. This is not an open democratic process. These 55 men do not reflect who lives in the United States. They're all men, they're all white, but beyond that, there tend to be very wealthy white men, right? 
So only about one out of a thousand white men would, would go to university in this period, right? Access to education, higher education is very limited. But half of the men in that room did. So they're 500 times more likely than the average American um, to be schooled in higher education. They are almost all wealthy. They have like bizarre names like Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer that reflect their kind of pretensions of nobility. In addition to this, they are so afraid of the public being involved that it's like a stifling hot summer. And even so, they close every window. This is in an era before air conditioning. So they close off all their airflow. They let the heat build up because they are so worried about people hearing out the window what they're saying. Uh, and they want to do it totally privately. So as a result, we know something about what happened in this room. We, we don't know 100% all of the debates because what we have are one person, a guy we'll meet later, you don't need to remember him for now, James Madison, his notes on what happened. But he didn't like just take careful notes and then publish them. He took careful notes, never published them until he was old, <laughs> revised them, changed them, perhaps to make himself look good, and then published them. So, you know, since then, historians have done a really good job looking at letters and private journals and reconstructing what happens. We have a pretty good sense. But I say all this just so that you have an idea that the Constitution of the United States was created basically in secret. And they come up with a constitution uh, that is basically our current constitution minus the amendments. But the constitution that they come up with, as I said, has been amended a bunch of times. So the things that they include aren't always the values we think about. So here's one clause from the constitution. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, sounds normal, chosen by the legislature thereof, not normal, for six years and each senator shall have one vote. Okay, normal again. Chosen by the legislature thereof. So initially, people in the United States didn't get to vote for their own senators. It would be like today, if the state legislature in Baton Rouge chose who would be the senators from Louisiana. And there's many examples like this. I've just given you one. One of the big debates roiling the Constitution, and it's kind of what it'll look like, is the debate over slavery. Some people, like people from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, want to ban slavery or at the very least ban the slave trade. Other places, representatives from South Carolina, say that if there aren't strong protections for both slavery and the slave trade, they will walk out and not join the new country. In the end, they come closer to winning out in that there are provisions that the United States legally cannot end the Atlantic slave trade for 20 years. This is why the US ends the Atlantic slave trade in 1808 it's 20 years after the Constitution. Um, there are other debates, and the most famous of which, or I should say infamous, centers over this, which is known as the Three-Fifths Clause. And it reads, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers. So what this first part means is voting, like how many members of Congress your state gets, and taxation, which at the time was based on population, will be counted by taking a census. And he says the number in the census will be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, so that just means all free people, including those bound to service for a term of years, so that's those indentured servants we talked about before, excluding Indians not taxed. So this means uh, indigenous people who are basically excluded from government are also excluded from the census, except for, yeah, anyway. And then it says three fifths of all other persons. So what it's saying is when the US is counting a census, is doing a census to decide how many people Virginia and New York have, which will then determine how many members of Congress they get, um, they're going to count all other persons, which is their bad euphemism for enslaved people, at a rate of three-fifths. 
which seems bizarre that you would count a human being at a rate of a fraction. What this was, was a result of debate and compromise between northern states who felt enslaved people should be counted towards taxes because they contributed to the economy, but not for voting because states refused to allow them to vote. And southern states that centered slavery who wanted enslaved people to count for voting because that would help them. They had large enslaved populations who they wouldn't allow to vote and not for taxes because they'd have to pay taxes. And in the end, this three-fifths clause says enslaved people are counted as three-fifths for both purposes. And the taxes are actually within the first decade of US history going to be abolished and not matter. So what it means is when the US is counting how many votes a place gets in the Electoral College, basically how many votes they get for the president and how many members of the House of Representatives they get, places with large enslaved populations get more votes than places without them. And these places, of course, don't allow enslaved people to vote. So it means that white people in slave states get more votes than people in states without or with little slavery. And this isn't a minor technicality. Thomas Jefferson, for example, who's the third president of the United States, would have lost one of his elections if it weren't for this, right? Uh, there are, you know, if we look at the first US presidents, who we'll get to later, but George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, um, four of the first five are enslavers from Virginia, right? And that's in part because this three-fifths clause exaggerates the political power of enslavers. In the end, uh, there's a document. For what it is, it's relatively short. Um, and it has to be ratified, meaning it has to be approved uh, by nine of the 13 states to take effect. There's huge debates over it that you're reading covers and we won't get into here. Uh, eventually it is ratified and the United States becomes a nation in 1789 with this constitution. Uh, some people would put it becoming a nation as early as 1783, but under its current form it's 1789. And the last thing I'll talk about is the Haitian Revolution. So as soon as this is wrapping up in the US, the revolution of the constitution, there's a revolution that begins in 1791, a couple years after the constitution in Haiti. And it lasts until at least 1804. And in 1804, uh, after over a decade of warfare um, with the French colonial forces, Haiti, which is a nation that is an overwhelmingly majority enslaved people who have been forced by the French to grow sugar uh, in this Caribbean island, create the first independent republic nation formed by people of African descent in the Americas. Uh, and the Haitian Revolution is something I really, you know, it's outside of the scope of our course to talk about it in great detail, but I really encourage you to read about, and I'm happy to sort of provide you with kind of books or articles or anything like that if you're interested. But for our purposes, what I think is useful is for us to think about how two nations who within a few years of each other have successful revolutions against European colonial powers to create new nations have such different priorities, right? The United States is controlled by white Americans and, the, and Haiti is controlled by black Haitians. Um, and the histories of the places, uh, the priorities that they have at their founding are very different as a result of their history. So I want to think that through, right, and think about um, how their declarations of independence look different, and we'll kind of revisit this later in our course. Um, as soon as Haiti gains its independence, it is immediately isolated and targeted by other European powers uh, who are determined to see it fail, right? The United States, however, after some initial tensions for a decade plus, two decades maybe, up to 30 years with Great Britain, quickly is accepted among European powers, right, uh, as like a primarily white nation, uh, at least at the leadership level. 
So these places look different and Haiti will become very connected to the United States in some ways, right? Especially in the imaginary of some enslaved people uh, who see Haiti as a beacon of hope and freedom, right? So we'll see uh, later in our course, right? Uprisings of enslaved people. Sometimes the goal is to get a ship and get to Haiti, right? Uh, and Haiti also becomes this thing that white, many white Americans are terrified of, right? They understand that they're oppressing ensla slave pe enslaved people in the United States, and they've seen not that long ago in Haiti what happened uh, when enslaved people gained control uh, and what could happen to them if they continue the practice of slavery. So we're going to leave the sort of big video lecture here. This was kind of a long one, so apologies for that. Uh, the case study will be very short, uh, so hopefully that balances it out a little bit. Um, and I will uh, see you in the case study video.